The Patterson Foundation strengthens people, organizations, and communities by focusing on issues that address mutual aspirations, foster wide participation, and encourage learning and sharing. All right, well, thank you so much, Deborah, for being here today. Um, welcome to the From Both Sides of the Check series podcast as part of the Patterson Foundation's Beyond the Blog series. So thank you so much, Deborah, for being here. Well, it's going to be an adventure, Andrew, together. Absolutely. So to kick us off, so today, the, this podcast is really about exploring the dynamics between nonprofits and funders and doing that through the lens of people that have been on both the nonprofit and funder sides. So Deborah, could you share with me, just to kick us off, what is your current role? Obviously, I know your current role because I work with you, but tell us about your current role. What does the day-to-day look like? And when you zoom out at the end of the year and the board zooms out at the end of the year, how do they think about Deborah is successful? So first of all, I am thrilled to be the president and CEO of the Patterson Foundation. I've actually, I'm the founding president and CEO of the Patterson Foundation. And I work with the governing board who has crafted our purpose to be, we strengthen individuals, organizations, and communities in ways that foster wide participation around shared aspirations. So rather than being a traditional grant maker, we look for ways to work in community, downloading proven practices from across the country, and then weaving and finding partners who are interested in that space and want to work together. That actually is kind of an ambiguous goal. So when we often want to track those outcomes and outputs, it's easy to, it's always easy to capture outputs. How many meetings, how many people, how many books, how many um, digital connections? But the bigger question is, so how's the world a better place because of it? And we've learned over time, meaningful change takes high engagement, patience, and continuous assessment of, is this working? Uh, Do we have people who care about what's happening? We actually always ask the question, who else cares and what's possible? But It's not a linear track. It's always ambiguous. The governing board has a tolerance for ambiguity and wants us to stay in the sandbox so that we can be a continuous learning organization. Awesome. Thank you for that. So your current role was preceded by other roles in your life. Mm -hmm. Can you specifically talk about what your nonprofit experience was before coming to the funder side? Yes. So as, as a, I was previous, I've had several career chapters Um, When I was a bank executive, often served on nonprofit boards. And while I was a bank executive, in addition to working on nonprofit boards, I discovered that I loved to work on strategic planning facilitation. So I not only served on boards, but I had the opportunities oftentimes just as a fun thing to facilitate board retreats or strategic planning for community organizations. That was as a banking professional. Then when I moved over into um, finding and igniting, actually, my philanthropy gene, when I went to Ringling College of Art and Design, that truly was an immersive experience in, oh, we are here because we have to raise money to fuel our purpose and our mission. So understanding the role that philanthropy played in that while Ringling College of Art and Design is highly regarded and does have its own income streams from uh, tuition, there's always that gap in a nonprofit organization that you've got to fill with hopefully vibrant philanthropy. So I had that, oh, how does this work? How does that, so with Ringling College. Then, even though my term there was limited because I got recruited to go to the Selby Foundation, I took so many lessons about he who is seeking funds versus he who is granting funds. I was fortunate at the Selby Foundation to also administer eight other independent foundations. I did, not the investment side, but rather the how are we going to make the world a better place side. So it uh, gave me an incredible learning opportunity about how philanthropy might work in different ways, depending on what different boards are interested in doing. Big lessons, big, huge lessons from my work at the Selby Foundation is there is so much value that a foundation can do beyond the check. While people want the money, it's how a foundation or anybody who cares about the sector 
can really, what's the value I can do beyond the money that is helpful to organizations and creating an open dialogue so that, okay, let's problem solve or let's aspiration explore beyond the actual, you want money for this today. So one of the belief statements of this podcast is that there's real value in having had experience on both sides of the check. And you mentioned a little bit already about how that experience at the Wrigling College of Art and Design helped prepare you for roles at Selby with those eight other foundations and now at the Patterson Foundation. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about how that experience has informed your perspective on how to do philanthropy? Yeah, so one one of my big lessons that I learned, uh, and um, so there's there's institutional philanthropy and then there's individual philanthropy. So I'm going to dwell a little bit first on the individual philanthropy and the importance of both nonprofits and foundations remembering the magic there. No one owns a donor. Donors do what donors want to do, but donors can do even more when they understand their possibilities. So anybody who's in the philanthropic sector, when someone is talking to them, it's helping them discover what their philanthropic passion is. Because so many people don't even know they have that passion until you unlock the door for people to say, what do they care about? Several of my most important experiences at Ringling College is when I would talk to people about what do they care about. Often it wasn't Ringling College of Art and Design. And I had more fun saying to them, well, okay, if you care about cats, why don't we go talk to XYZ Cat Organization? And they were incredulous that I, who was supposed to raise money for Ringling College, would actually take me to another nonprofit who might take all of their resources, which you're never going to take all of a, a giver's resources. They they know what they want to give. But it also ended up with people who loved Ringling College because you know what they do over there? They actually care about what I care about. And the money actually oftentimes came back to Ringling, if not from that donor, from a friend of theirs as they told the story. So that ability to listen to what's important to people, and then using your privilege and power to connect people on what's important to them. Very, I think that's a very important thing. Now, I'm totally forgetting the question, but I can answer it again from whatever perspective you want. Well, I think you are answering the question. And if you want to add, the, the question was really about how your experiences on the nonprofit and specifically the fundraising side informed your perspective of philanthropy. And so something I'm hearing is one of the things we talk about the Patterson Foundation is moving from scarcity to abundance. Mm -hmm. That even in your time at the Ringling College, you didn't approach it with a scarcity mindset of, I need to convince this funder to give to my organization because it's the most important. You really said, no, there's an abundance of resources here. And if they don't give to me, that's okay. Really, it's I'm listening deeply, coming into authentic partnership with this donor and directing them to where it makes sense. And another piece of that is silos to systems. You weren't thinking about the Ringling College as its own institution. You're thinking about it as part of a larger ecosystem and to support any organization that can be powerful there, but also ultimately positively impact the Ringling College too. Yes, and that brings me to the... Um... The power of helping people understand how they fit into the ecosystem. And so often, nonprofit organizations, even when I was at Ringling College, we were focused on what was going on at Ringling College. But I learned when I went over to the Selby Foundation and now at the Patterson Foundation, running a nonprofit organization is not for those who are weak of heart. You've got to have passion, expertise, experience, both on the staff side and on the board side. And oftentimes organizations are so focused on what they are doing right now that scarcity mentality can get in there. And the opportunity a funder has is to when they have time with the person who's seeking grant money, which they have to find money, broadening that conversation to what else is going on. What else is going on to hold you back? What else is going on that might propel you to future opportunities? So a funder, a grant maker, has the opportunity to shift the conversation just a little bit. I found when I was at Selby that often on Monday, I might talk to an executive director about a challenge that they're having. And then by Friday, a board chair is talking to me at the same organization. And I want to dwell on this for the moment. 
it's not because you're an important funder. It's the um, behavior, the reputation that you have as a trusted voice thought partner. And that doesn't just happen because you met somebody at the latest fundraiser. It takes a lot of time to build those relationships and those trust relationships, but it's also amazing when you can be a sounding board to let people find their own solutions and be comfortable with them moving forward. But you know, it's lonely being a board chair and it's lonely being a nonprofit exec. So sometimes foundations um, can add value in creating safe space for conversations. But it doesn't just happen because you think you want to do it. It's got to happen over time. Yeah, it takes a real intentionality to really think, okay, how am I going to be a convener? How can I facilitate collaboration? How can I leverage this ecosystem perspective to help move impact forward as strong as possible? Mm -hmm. So let's, part of this, so this podcast in part is to really cultivate empathy and understanding between nonprofits and funders and to give a peek into if you're particularly if you haven't worked for a foundation before, what is that role actually like on day to day and how do people feel about their roles? So I'm going to ask a, a, a favorite, least favorite sequence of questions. Mm -hmm. So Deborah, what is your favorite part about your job at the Patterson Foundation? Um, that's easy. It's working with other passionaries and possibilitarians. It's finding people who truly want to figure out what's possible and how we can do it because it. The the um, society is filled with turmoil, particularly in the times we live. You know, I'm pretty sure society has always been filled with turmoil. It's just our turmoil that we have right now. But it's working with people who will, won't let the bad overwhelm them, but will continue to find what we can do. It's a little bit of the Spartacus syndrome. He never gave up, even though in the warrior times, he could have, should have very easily, but he didn't give up. And, you know, we have an awful lot of wonderful things happening all the time. So best part is working with other possibilitarians about what can happen. Awesome. And if it's if it exists, what's your least favorite part about the role? Well, I, honestly, I think I'm so darn for, fortunate, but there are moments you go, really? All right. So I think it's also staying centered and reminded, no matter how passionate I might be about something else, the world all has different rhythms, and it's reminding myself about that um, the whole idea of every day people are either in a cope mode, an adapt mode, or an innovative mode. So I'm fortunate. I can live in the innovative mode all the time, but if I don't have my empathy antenna up to my fellow, my colleagues, or those that are working in the field, I don't care how clever my idea might be, it's not going anywhere when someone's in a cope phase. So I think that that, that self-awareness and the um, understanding that there's rhythms all over the place and it's figuring out how to, at the right time, listen closely and how can we knit those rhythms. Got it. I'm going to detour, Andrew, just because of some things I'm working on right now and, again, the turmoil that we have in society. People are so fixated on whether it's politics or ideologies, and and I, I'm, I'm in co as many conversations as I can. I'm trying to elevate people up a higher balcony level, 30,000 feet, to go, all right, Yes, there's bad stuff happening, but each one of us has a responsibility to figure out what what does quality of life look like for through everybody's lens and trying to figure out how can we use words that don't separate us, but words that can bring us together. So my, my theme of the week is let's talk more about the importance of all quality of life aspects and what does excellence look like? Whether it's health, whether it's education, whether it's public safety, whether it's environment, what does excellence look like? And that moves the conversation from the, well, this isn't going to work, or, you know, that's not going to happen, or, you know, I don't agree with them. Okay, we're interested in what does excellence look like in these factors, and, and I'm determined to find threads that we can weave together for a better society. So diving deeper into this experience of nonprofit to funder and those experiences you've had, if you, if you could go back in time and tell your nonprofit self when you were at the Ringling College, 
here's what I know now that I wish you knew then. Well, what would you go back and tell yourself? Well, it doesn't matter how much you need the money. You must, one must understand the person you're talking to who you'd like to give you money may not align with their values or what their system is at the moment. So take your time to learn whoever you're talking to, to tell your story, make sure you're listening to what matters to them. I actually love my three favorite questions when it's time when you are, whether you're a staff member or a board member of a nonprofit, your job, whoever you are, is to be able to tell the story of your organization, what's going on, what are your priorities, however much time you have. But then the three questions you should always ask are, number one, so what do you think? And you've left it open for people to say, I think this or I don't care, or whatever they want to say. What do you think? Question number two is, how do you see yourself getting involved? And they may say to you, I don't. And you can say to them, well, thank you very much, but you now know our story. But they may open the door and go, I don't know enough to know how I'd get involved. Oh my gosh, is there a better thing for someone to say to you than I don't know? You, it opens the door for, well, why don't you come over for a visit? Why don't we talk again? So that number two question is, how do you see yourself getting involved? And then the one that is uh, the, the hidden power, who else deserves to hear our story? Because again, there may be other people that this person knows who really w might like your mission and bring them to the table. So again, it's it, what, uh, but I've learned that over the years. I was, I had an instance when I was at Ringling and I had a cool idea about what we should get a grant for and we got turned down. And I'm like, well, why, this was a good thing. They should have given it to us. And then I, now, then I learned how do foundations work and what do they think about? But at that time I was a novice and I didn't know. So it's understanding again, whether it's an institutional funder or an individual funder, be aware of what is important to them and what their decision-making processes are, it'll better inform and not waste your time as a nonprofit funder, funding seeker. Yeah, and I'm, I'm hearing more TPF sort of values and themes emerge here, like really leaning to humility and curiosity. And then one of our sayings, right, don't arrive with the answer. So you're not arriving assuming that they're going to give to you or they're super invested. Just what do you think? Mm -hmm. How do you see yourself showing up and being okay with, I don't see myself showing up, and still recognizing that they have a network and they might have people in their world that might be interested in being involved. That goes back to what you're saying about getting the story really right so they understand your work and even if it doesn't align with them, then they could still be an advocate for the work if they know people that are interested. Mm -hmm. I love mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So thinking more about the nonprofit funder relationship, what do you wish more funders knew about the nonprofit experience and what do you wish nonprofits knew more about the funder experience? Yeah. Um, so, uh, um, I, I may not have the, these eight things, but I think funders have the opportunity to create places for both sides to be in the room together without, without telling everybody what they're supposed to do. Funders are, can be very good at convening people to say, this is our grant cycle. This is how it works. This is how you fill out the paperwork and go home and know that how much fun it could be as we shift as, as people, how much more exciting it can be as people are like, let's um, change the dynamic such that we're both co-creating the future and seek before we declare. And so creating those um, opportunities for people to be together to talk about, I'm gonna go again, a bigger excellence and then we find out again, who cares about that? So I times the non-renewable resource, people are convening people all the time. Here's the one that drives me crazy. Um, the power of invitation that a funder has, people will say yes, because they're pretty sure there's a check under the chair. Okay, so if a funder asks you to come to a convening, you go. But how is it always the best use of your time is the topic of how we're going to talk about is, but you want to show up so that you're ready at any time in case there's a way to get to the ATM. So the shifting that dynamic in terms of 
can we have a conversation together? What's important to you? What are the issues? What are you facing? That we funders aren't. I, we are not wizards at everything that is going on. In fact, the wizards are probably out in the field, toiling every day, and we could stand to learn a heck of a lot more. Okay, so before we do the second half of the question, yes. sort of what what you wish nonprofits knew about the funder side, mm-hmm. I want to dive a little bit deeper into that. So, how in your role? I mean, clearly you're describing a dynamic that can mm-hmm. be challenging because nonprofits are just going to show up mm-hmm. if funders ask. Um, but as you said, it may not always be the best use of your time. And so there's there's a, this kind of power dynamic there mm-hmm. that um, doesn't necessarily always lead to the most excellence like you talked about before. So how do you approach relationships with nonprofits, the community in a way that mitigates that power dynamic and um, tries to cultivate more trust. I know one of our sayings here is change happens at the speed of trust. So how do you how do you approach doing that? So at the Patterson Foundation, because of our approach of working through initiatives rather than having grant cycles, th- th- we are hoping that it actually has changed that dynamic of, oh, I better show up because I want to make sure I get a grant. So that's a long-term thing. People still think that they should come in and pitch a latest idea. And quite frankly, we don't do that. Um, there isn't enough time in the day to meet with the 1,000 organizations and their board members who have really cool ideas. So the Patterson Foundation focuses on its initiatives where we go out into community at, rather than community coming into the Patterson Foundation. And we try to find willing people, willing, interested partners who are interested in working in that space. So let's take Digital Access for All as an example. All right, what does every business and nonprofit have? Every one of them has employees and customers or clients, all right? And in the day where if we do not have access to affordable broadband, we don't have a machine and we don't know how to use it, whoever, customer, staff member, whoever human is not part of a vibrant society. But nonprofits are very focused on their mission and not necessarily about how can I make sure each of my um, audiences are as uh, connected and digital as they could be. So we go, all right, who would like to have digital navigators to help your staff, your your clients be better? And rarely is that one of the position descriptions in a nonprofit organizations today, but wouldn't that be something that in your HR stuff you would want to have, I got to make sure everybody has the tools that they need for being most effective. So this is a very long way to say, just because you have the idea of let's help nonprofits have digital navigators. That's uh, definitely an example of finding partners who have the leadership, willingness, readiness, capacity, and culture to do it. And it's a long term who wants to experiment with this to see that it works. When it works, it's almost magical to see how it becomes part of the organization rather than a, 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 a foundation good idea to add a little bit onto that. So um, I, the dynamic is when, as a funder, when organizations and community, when they understand what we do, we can be more helpful as we work with them. So it's a different way TPF works, the Patterson Foundation in that, but we're finding that our little trust level goes up with, and this this is anecdotal, but it's like when the Suncoast Campaign for Grade Level Reading says, would you like to participate? Some people will go, nope, that's not me, or yes, I've had experience and it really does strengthen me. So we give the y'all come, and then people sort themselves out. Yeah, and that's one of the unique things about the Patterson Foundation, right? So you've structurally shifted the way that a foundation can employ its strategy, and in doing so, you've created an environment where trust can be heightened and partnership can happen in community. And uh, so, that, yeah, that, that's I, I appreciate that. So to the second half of the question from before, what do you wish more nonprofits knew about the funder or foundation uh, side of things. Well, I, I, I'm going to go back to, I, I'm back. Okay. So funders need to know more about the nonprofits they want to work with. Nonprofits need to know more about the funders. So, and I do, I think it's, it's in our region, we are blessed to be philanthropically endowed. We have 
between our four counties, we have four community foundations, five community foundations maybe. We have um, immense number of family and uh, private foundations that are here. So think about being a nonprofit going, oh, where am I going to go to help get money? You as the nonprofit have to figure out what every one of those foundations care about and want to do. But you know what? It's the same as you have to figure out what every donor wants to do. So it's finding where there's alignment. So what I wish nonprofits would do is not tr would is to understand that foundations are as distinctly different as donors and figuring out which are the logical ones for you to learn more about and not try to know about everybody. It's a waste of many people's times because foundations foundations have limited resources of what they will give just like a donor does. And they can't be all things to all people. So I, I, I encourage nonprofits to think who are the ones that I need to pay attention to because they're aligned with what our purpose and mission is as a nonprofit organization. Yeah, it's such a key part of what I'm hearing is that it t that takes a lot of both self-awareness, like organization self-awareness, and an understanding of understanding of the ecosystem to approach fundraising with that level of confidence mm -hmm. to not feel desperate of like I need to get funding from every conversation that I have instead it's no I'm looking for people and organizations that align with my vision mission and values and how can we work together moving forward mm -hmm. so again remember foundation think of them as just a donor who's got procedures great mm -hmm. so this, this question might be best situated for um, thinking back to uh, your Selby Foundation days and administrating foundations, or sorry, administering those eight other foundations mm -hmm. that you described. Well, in those roles, and maybe for a more typical grant-making foundation, well, could you describe your sort of dream partnership between funders and nonprofits in that kind of role? Mm -hmm. So... In, it, we always need to remind ourselves that in the ecosystem of a vibrant community, um, foundations are like the, you can choose if you want to be a freckle or a dimple, all right? It, it, the complexion of a community. So sometimes foundations are perceived as all powerful and the reality is no foundations all powerful. It really, the communities, the community sometimes doesn't even know how powerful they are. So I think it's always important for a funder to be self-aware. As much as we want um, nonprofits to be self-aware, funders should be self-aware as well about we aren't, the, we are not, we might, some people think we're smarter, we're funnier, we're, you know, more whatever. No, we're not. We're just people who care about what a mission is. So I think that uh, self-awareness is very important. Uh, uh, can there be a dream partnership? Yeah, maybe we can strive for it, might not get to totally dream. I think it's the awareness. Time is the non-renewable resource. The dream partnership is all those who are in the partnership are respectful of the other or of the other sides, um, time limitations, interests. So a dream partnership is where I understand you. And I, I am going to do everything that I can is I fit into who you are and how you, you work. And so I'm going to go more into what it takes to do that. I think the more times a funder can factor in authentic conversations with groups or authentic conversations with the individual potential partner is, is the dream. It's when people start to really get each other and respect each other. And it's not the I have the money and you want the money. So it's figuring out how to have, build a relationship, not so that's taken for granted. Oh yeah, if you talk to her this way, you're sure to get approved. That's not it. It's about, it's actually never about the individual grant. It's about what are we trying to do for the betterment of the world. So, I, so I, I'm so i gonna undergird this, where are the shared aspirations? of whatever the funder's mission and purpose is, where does this group of nonprofits, they want that similar excellence, and what can we each bring to the table to catapult it forward? So, and that's work. It's, you got to figure out ways to do that so it's not transactional 
and it allows time for relationships to bud. And um, we're, we are allowed to say what's not working. All right. It, it, then you'll know it's working. See, if people are allowed, if people who are uh, toiling out in the field are comfortable enough to call you up and say, can I talk through this problem? You know that you, you've now got a dream partnership because they're not worried about, can I tell her or not, or hey, tell, because it might hurt funding going forward. So it's not about the money, it's about the relationship. So that's the, that's the dream partnership. When you are comfortable that you can t expose your foible to the other person, then that's not easy. It takes a lot of time. And quite frankly, another part, funders don't have to do it all. We can actually facilitate things. Okay, there, there are people who are beautiful facilitators about bringing people together. And actually, sometimes you might need to bring people together without funders in the room so that you can really get authentic input in what you're trying to figure out. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Deborah. Before we close out, is there, just, is there anything else that you'd like to share related to this topic that you haven't had a chance to share yet? So whether you're a funder, whether you're a nonprofit, whether you're a staff person, whether you're a board member, you know, those are four different um, entities. Please remember that it's a privilege to serve in this space. Again, whether you're paid or whether you're a volunteer, you get extra credit if you're a volunteer, but it's a privilege. So take it seriously about what are we, how are we trying to make the world more vibrant? And don't get lost into the, don't get pulled into the, it's a problem, we can't do anything about it. And, and forgetting that there are joyful moments, even in the most troubling of circumstances. So allow this to um, percolate in such a way that there is that joy factor. If you're doing important work, make sure you allow yourself the opportunity to find a bit of sparkle along the way. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Deborah. Really appreciate you taking the time and grateful for the work that you're, you're doing in our community. Well, and bravo to you, Andrew. You're an excellent interviewer. Awesome. Thank you. Listeners, thanks for joining us Beyond the Blog.